Good. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, before we introduce our speaker, uh, uh, I'd like to read the Tulane Land Acknowledgement. Oh, I'm John Lewis Howard, Associate Director of the Murphy Institute. I forgot to introduce myself. That was awkward. Uh, and so I, I'd like to read this acknowledgement. Uh, with gratitude and honor, I acknowledge as and pay tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The city of New Orleans is a continuation of an indigenous trade hub on the Mississippi River known for thousands of years as Bulbancha. Native peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and the resilient voices of Native Americans remain an inseparable part of our local culture. With gratitude and honor, we acknowledge the indigenous nations that have lived and continue to live and thrive here. Thank you. Uh, now, allow me to introduce uh, the uh, Director of the Center for Public Policy Research and Professor of Political Science, Stan Oklobjian. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, like John said, I'm Stan Oklubchia. I'm an assistant professor of political science and the director of the Center for Public Policy Research at the Murphy Institute. So my center, alongside the Center for Ethics, the Department of Political Science, and the Center for Inter-American Policy and Research, is proud to sponsor today's events. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank Mrs. Murphy, who is here in attendance for her generosity, um, which keeps our institute going. So in addition to events like the one you're seeing today, the Murphy Institute's three centers, the Center for Ethics, the Center for Public Policy Research, and the Center on Law and the Economy, offer public programming and events that address diverse topics related to the complex economic, moral, and political problems that we all face and think about. We at the Murphy Institute sponsor a robust seminar series for the departments of economics, political science, and philosophy, as well as for the School of Law. If you enjoy this type of discussion and engagement and would like to learn more about the Murphy Institute's sponsored events, programs, and conferences, we encourage you to check in at the table outside to pick up a flyer, snap the QR code, or share your email address with us for more information about our events. Today at the Murphy Institute is pleased to welcome Professor Beatriz Magaloni of Stanford University as our featured speaker for today's Center for Ethics public lecture. She's the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations at Stanford's Department of Political Science and a senior fellow, fellow at the Freeman Spoli Institute for International Studies, where she's also the director of the Poverty, Violence, and Government Lab. Professor Magaloni's research focuses on political economy of development, investigating themes surrounding state repression, police, human rights, and violence, particularly in Latin America. Her work has appeared in several top journals, and her book, Voting for Autocracy, was recognized by the American Political Science Association with the 2007 uh, Leon D. Epstein Outstanding Book Award. In, profess in uh, 2023, Professor Magaloni received the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, the world's most prestigious award in that field. Today's lecture is entitled Challenges in Creating More Humane and Equitable Policing, a Focus on the Global South. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Professor Beatriz Magaloni. Uh, thank you very much. I want to begin by thanking the Murphy Institute for inviting me uh, to give this talk, uh, or Martin also uh, for inviting me um, to share this research that I've been doing for the last, well, by now it's 15 years on violence and policing in Latin America. Specifically, I focus on Brazil and Mexico. And I am going to um, tell you what I've learned um, about the challenges in creating more humane and equitable policing, specifically focusing on these, con in the, on these countries. Um, what I'm going to present has some disturbing um, data and also information, so I just want to uh, warn you with that. Um, and there are some optimistic findings, but there are also some pessimistic findings in my work. And I'm going to focus today on policing only. I'm not going to focus on the challenge of violence, which is uh, also very um, problematic in, in these countries I study. So I, I want to begin by uh, reflecting a little bit about 
the problem in, in abstract terms. So in, in the literature in political science and in general in sociology, philosophy, we understand that the monopoly of violence uh, in the hands of the state is essential. It's essential uh, not only for promoting economic development, but also it makes it uh, possible that individuals do not fight each other, resort to vigilantism and frontier justice to settle their disputes. So this is essential, is, is to have a legitimate coercive war in the hands of the state. But the problem um, is that the state can also turn violence against its citizens. And in the places I study, the state, uh, often the police, can also become an extension of criminality rather than a solution to it. And this really creates a lot of problems for the populations who live in these settings. Um, so the problem of police abuse and violence has been really gaining a lot of international um, attention. Um, here in the US, this uh, problem has been uh, gaining a lot of attention uh, since many years ago, but in the last few years, since the murder, gross of murder of George Floyd and many other atrocities that the police has uh, committed here in the United States. But in the country that I study, Brazil, police killed at least 10 times more in per, per capita terms than in the US. Uh, and these killings affect primarily the people of color, black Brazilians, and also people of mixed race, <coughs> living in marginalized communities such as the favelas. Um, police violence has also been prevalent in Colombia, in the Philippines, and in Mexico, I will show as well. So in many democratic countries, unfortunately, this problem is endemic. So the violence of the state against its citizens is not only common in autocracies, but it's really common in democracies. And this creates a puzzle for political scientists. Because we generally tend to understand that democracy brings institutional uh, limits to state power. There is a very extensive literature in political science that has shown that democratic regimes are less prone to use state repression against, for example, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, or opposition groups. Um, and the reason that democracies tend to repress less has to do, on the one hand, with electoral accountability mechanisms, but also with institutional uh, constraints. So normally in democracies, you have an independent judiciary, you have uh, checks and balances that make it, make, makes it less likely that the state will use uh, violence against its citizens. But the problem is that, that we observe violence uh, through policing, exercising democracies and in autocracies. So this literature is sort of not so helpful in understanding why police remains such a repressive institution in many areas of the world. Uh, so these are the research questions that I'm going to be addressing as I present different aspects of my work. So what are the challenges in creating humane and equitable policing? What are the institutional, organizational, and societal obstacles to creating policing based on the rule of law? And specifically, I will address the following question. What works and does not work to constrain police abuse? And here, I'm talking about many forms of police abuse. One of the, the forms of police abuse I study is the use of illegal arrest, the fabrication of evidence, and the use of torture to extract confessions in regular criminal trials. But I also study the use of excessive and illegitimate use of lethal force. Um, and summarizing the main causes, I would walk you through in this presentation. So one of the main uh, limitations, or the main um, uh, explanations for some of the observed behavior of police is that we have very weak due process constitutional protections and an inquisitorial criminal justice system that has survived in Latin America until very recently. And I'll show the countries that have begun to reform these institutions are like Mexico in the last 10 years, have made some advances in constraining these forms of abuses, but it's not on, until very recently that these institutions have been reformed. I will also show that militarized security policies 
um, are very much associated with high levels of police violence. And in, a lot, in the countries I study, this has been a predominant way in which governments have chosen to um, uh, 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 fight crime and contain violence. Uh, obviously, there are very violent threats to the state in this setting, so we have very highly organized, powerful criminal organizations, and that creates a challenge for the state. And often, the states resort to this type of security strategies that, unfortunately, violate human rights and don't necessarily control violence. And then, in the case of Brazil in particular, but I think this is um, quite a generalizable phenomenon, we observe that racial segregation and income inequalities are strongly associated with police violence. Um, so let me be, begin by uh, studying a little bit this problem of inquisitorial justice in Latin America. So in continental Europe, these inquisitorial systems were abandoned in the, in the 18th century. But in Latin America, we didn't reform these systems that were inherited from our colonial um, past. Um, the reforms started in, in Latin America, in Argentina in 1991, Bolivia 1999, Chile 2000, Colombia, and then there is a list of countries that have finally reformed these colonial inquisitorial institutions. So you can observe Mexico, which I'm going to be focusing in, in, in the next um, slides on, it didn't begin to reform its inquisitorial system until 2008. And in reality, in practice, these reforms didn't start to um, become a reality until 2013. And Mexico transitioned to democracy in 2000. So we observed that during a long, many years during the democratic period, we still had these very inquisitorial institutions. And the same can be said about most democracies in the region. I just learned that Uruguay recently reformed its inquisitorial system last year. So it's, it's like a general trend in the region, and it's a very important one. But as I said, most democracies in the region were born with these inquisitorial institutions. Um, so when, what, what do we mean by inquisitorial institutions? Uh, and I can make a summary um, with the following um, example. So I, I'm also a lawyer, I'm a, a political science, but I am also a lawyer in Mexico. And I used to, before I became a, um, a professor, used to litigate pro bono cases in Mexico in, in, in trials. And the way the trials happened is that the accused were behind bars there was no judge in the trial, and there was only the prosecutor present in the hearings, and then a um, mechanical typewriter, a secretary with a typewriter who was just transcribing everything that happened in the hearings. The judges were never present, and the decisions that came at the end, when the judges read all the written material, were entirely based on what the police said had happened during the, the phase of investigation and during the time of the arrest. What it really meant is that there was no evidence brought to trial, but that what the police had said in that phase. And in that phase of investigation, there was no one controlling the, the police or the prosecutors. Uh, this, um, this not only happened in Mexico, but is the way criminal trials have happened in Latin America before the reforms. So now we observe with the reforms, a really significant change has occurred. The reform was wide ranging and it implied uh, uh, retraining judges, retraining prosecutors, re re refitting all the courts so that there can be now oral trials. There is a jury, um, meaning that the just judges now base their decisions on not on written documents as before, but uh, on what is being said in the, in the, in the hearings. And it's very important that now there are three judges, one which is called, who is called the judge of control that has uh, oversight of what, what the police is doing during the phase of investigation. Then there is a second judge that oversees the trials. And then there is a third judge that oversees the execu execution of the sentences. And in the case of Mexico, because torture was a very generalized practice given these incentives, the constitution also says that Torture is prohibited, that, the, that, um, that um, confessions given before uh, the police are not valid. 
Um, so these are really significant reforms, and I would show you that it changed very much the incentives for police to torture. Okay, so now I'm going to zoom in Mexico, and this is a really interesting picture. When you go into the Supreme Court, there are these very tall um, uh, walls painted by murals of uh, this painter, Rafael Cauduro, and it's, it really documents all the atrocities that the police and the military committed during the era of authoritarianism in Mexico. And one of the justices in the Supreme Court um, asked this uh, artist to paint these murals. And what is really striking is that we see, as you enter the court, you see the military repressing the students in 1968. You see a lot of the history of, of um, repression. But what you also see are these images of torturing criminal, regular um, uh, suspects in criminal trials. This was the most common form of state, um, state abuse. Uh, and so this is very inspiring to me because in a way it's saying from the court, this is our history and we are recognizing it. But obviously th this didn't happen until very recently. Okay, so uh, the, what I'm going to show you is that torture was the form of investigation in Mexico, that police didn't and has, have not developed investigative capacity. So what they normally do is they detain someone, and they torture the person, and obviously obtain a confession, and that's the evidence that is offered in court. Um, so torture is obviously um, fundamentally incompatible with the principles of human dignity. It undermines the core principles of justice. But it also lacks justification because information obtained through torture often leads to false or, or misleading confessions. And in Mexico, in 2015, the U UN General Rapporteur stated that torture remained a generalized practice in Mexico. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to study torture because it happens in hidden places. <laughs> Police hide their, you know, their, their atrocities. So, um, but what is really striking is that the Supreme Court, you know, before the, you know, the, the, the new era that I have just shown with the pictures of, of the murals, used to endorse torture with its jurisprudence. So I'm here just citing two of the decisions of the court. One is that the verification of traces of physical maltreatment by the defendant during the detention does not invalidate a confession if it is corroborated by other evidence on file. So that is a way of saying um, you can torture and go ahead. And then another, uh, another of the court's um, jurisprudence is if a defendant were to try to change his statement before a judge, the statement given to the public minister, who is the prosecutor at the time of the arrest, should be given more weight, and listen what the court you say, because it would have been the most spontaneous. So the court during all the era of authoritarian politics in Mexico justified what obviously was happening in this way. And so how do you restrain this form of police uh, abuse? And this is a really significant uh, question. Uh, so in this paper that I wrote with a student of mine, Luis Rodriguez, that, that we published in the American Political Science Review, we argue that there are two factors that shape the incidents of, of, of torture. One of them is the one that I have mentioned. It's weak constitutional protections. So the reform in Mexico that I will sh uh, show you how it has happened should reduce torture because it does introduce checks and balances. It introduces judicial oversight over what police do, and it increases due process protection in the Constitution. So that's the main reason why, why torture happens is because they are weak uh, judicial protections and due process protections. And the other reason that we observe such an increase in torture, I will show also with the data, is these militarized security interventions. In 2006, uh, the President Calderón in Mexico decided to start a, a war on drugs. Uh, but this is not only unique to Mexico. A lot of the countries that I study have these security strategies. and. The drug on war implied that the armed forces were deployed to perform regular security functions and that the police were acting in coordination with the armed forces. 
And I will show that when that happened, to torture significantly increased. Why? Because you introduce into the police a, mentality, a military mentality in which suspects and criminals are treated as enemies or in war. And they are really um, not given institutional protections. So these two factors are critical for understanding atrocities. How do we study them? And that's a really interesting point. So fortunately, I began working together with my sister, who is a lawyer um, in Mexico as well, uh, on some of these questions. And she began uh, conducting surveys in federal prisons in which uh, questions about how prisoners were treated were asked in these uh, surveys. And then the INEGI, which is the Mexican Statistical Office, took these questions. And now we have a national representative sample of the entire prison population in Mexico. In 2016, a survey was con conducted among prisoners, asking them questions about their lives in prison, their situation, but how they were treated during the phase of investigation, during their arrest. And so that's the, the, the data that I'm going to be using. And now we have another survey collected by the same statistical office in 2021. So this really allows us to understand what would be very, very hard to understand. And someone might argue, do you believe in, in, in the prisoners' um, voices? And it's a really interesting uh, question. And we've seen in the data that the, the reported atrocities do not vary uh, if you are already convicted or if you are expecting conviction. So the prisoners were told that these uh, reports were not going to affect their, um, in their trials, how the judges would decide. And if you see the data, it looks the same. So we're confident that the voices are telling us you know, what is happening in, in those uh, uh, dark places. But I have to mention that this is not the only source of information. As I'm, Human Rights Watch has extensive reports on these forms of abuse happening. As I mentioned, the general rapporteur of the UN also talking about torture. So this is something that is sort of common knowledge or was common knowledge, but there was no way we could measure it with this precision. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just uh, use these um, responses to show how torture looks in Mexico and then how torture responds to these two factors that I have just uh, explained to you. One is the criminal justice reform and the other is militarized security interventions. And so when we hear the prisoners' voices, we start to hear things like we were electrocuted, we were drowned, we were suffocated, we were asphyxiated, we were stabbed, crushed were heavy objects and burned. Um, and so to, for these abuses to happen, we call it institutional torture. There has to be some institutional um, space where you can do perform these abuses. So that's why we call institutional, because it has to be institutionalized. There has to be a space, and there has to even be knowledge as to how to carry out these type of abuses. Then brute force is when, uh, when prisoners uh, report being beaten, you know, um, kicked, and so on. And then there is also threats that are common, uh, threats to harm family against obviously uh, the family of the, of the, of the accused. So we, we classify these the three forms of, of um, and I don't know if you can see, but here is before they arrive to the, the MP is the public minister. So that, that's where the invest investigation begins and is the prosecution, is when the prosecution start. Before this, is the, the, the suspects are in the hands of the police. So for example, here, beatings, 56% report being um, beaten uh, before they arrive to the public minister, and 39 after they arrive. And so we can see crush with heavy objects, 35%, suffocated or drowned, 34%. So this is all the, uh, the, the, the abuses that they report, false charges harming family, held incommunicado, stripped, tied, blindfolded. And we can see that the, these forms of abuse are quite common in, in Mexico. Um, and I'm sorry, this doesn't look quite good. This is 80% of the cases uh, 
reporting torture, and these are the years. So the prisoner was um, uh, arrested in 1989. 1991, this line refers to the year the PRI lost power and there was a transition to democracy. And here is when the drug war begins. So you can see this increase. And here this line is when the criminal justice system, uh, reform begins, begins to unfold. So what is really striking of the, this is torture, this is brute force and these are threats. So you see very high levels of torture happening after the transition to democracy, there is a slight reduction, but still around 50% are reporting, are report, report being tortured. And then when the drug war starts, this increases to on average 60%. And now we observe still very high levels, it's around 40%, so it's still very high. Um, but what I'm really trying to point out here is that just by looking at the average um, uh, report, we see this very, large increase here during the drug war and it appears that there is an effect of the reform. So we can use statistical analysis to be able to understand whether that is in effect the result of that reform and in effect the result of the militarized interventions. And I, I'm not going to show you the statistics but I'm, I'm just going to show you how the data looks. Um, just a little bit of, of the back, how the reform happened. The reform was introduced in the Constitution in 2008, but President Calderón didn't want to implement it because he was fighting a drug, the drug war. So he pushed it to the next administration, and the, 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 the reform started to be implemented in different states at the, uh, different times. So we have the reform being implemented from 2013 all the way until 2000. Uh, 16. So those years in, and states begin reforming at different moments. And that allows us to analyze this statistically and identify the effects. Um, and so the, the reform, we are able to see when a prisoner is arrested in a given locality. And we are able to see if in that place the reform has entered or not entered. So we can really create like a time series with these uh, answers to see how torture moves across time. And just to give you a sense of how the data looks, um, so this is uh, brute force before the reform, 67% reported that after the reform, 45%. So there is a 21% difference and this is statistically uh, significant. Institutional torture drops from 55 to 34 and threats from 64 to 45. So we observe quite large decreases in torture. Um, and just, just to compare the little effect that the democracy had, so we can isolate the moment in which in that locality, the former ruling party associated with authoritarianism lost the power for, for the first time. And we can see how torture changed as a result of that. And we see very little change as a result of democracy, but we see very large changes as a result of the institutional reform. So these are some optimistic findings, uh, but there are also pessimistic findings in, in, in the results, as I show you that huge increase in torture. So how can we know, you know that is um, causing torture to increase? We observed that um, President Calderon had this called joint operations in which the armed forces were sent to different states in Mexico to fight drug cartels next hand in hand with local police forces. And so that we, that's a militarized intervention that we can measure how the behavior of police changes when that happens. Um, and then we can also look at, look at turf wars happening in Mexico. So this is, uh, data that we have been constructing since, we look at the homicide rate since 1990 to till, um, till today. And so we can see in each municipality when that rate of homicide increases by a very sharp increase, like three standard deviations relative to a historic mean. And that means that there is something really wrong happening in that place, and we call it a turf war. So you can see those red uh, circles are turf wars, and the bigger they are is the more uh, people that they have died as a result of these turf wars. So we can also observe what happens when there is a turf war and then an arrest happens in that locality. And the results basically 
uh, once we do the statistical analysis um, that I'm not going to go um, and explain here in detail, but it allows to, uh, to really be able to isolate whether this is the cause or not. So we can really make some causal claims about the effects of these variables. And these are the results. Once we do this statistical analysis, we observe that as a result of the reform, we have a 22% decrease in torture. But, but the torture increases with military interventions by 17% and also due to torture wars by 27%. So we can really isolate these two effects that I was talking about. One is militarized interventions. Clearly, they increase state brutality. <coughs> Uh, but also high violent threats to the state. These third wars make police behave more violently. And if you introduce institutional reforms, you can restrain, um, you can restrain to torture. Um, this is now using the data of the new survey. And we can observe also other very interesting th happen, uh, things happening in, in the trials. This is the moment the reform uh, starts. And this is a prisoner that was arrested one year before the reform, two years before, three years, eight years before the reform, and five years after the reform, because that's the, 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 the date of the survey. So we, we can perform the same statistical analysis to see how the reform affected, for example, whether a judge is, is present in the trial. And so you see that before the reform, judges were never present in trials, and now with the reform, 80% of prisoners report that yes, now they have a judge present in the trial. Um, defense attorneys, we observe that there is more presence, but not a sharp increase with the reform. Uh, the public minister present, it's a, uh, victim present is a very sharp increase. But what is really very interesting here is to show that now the, the suspects are, are not held behind bars and are not handcuffed during the trials. So this is a very significant decrease. So what it means is that now trials are happening. The way one looks at, when I was in, you know, in Mexico, we would observe the trials in the US with a jury, and, you know, and that was not what was happening in Mexico at all, right? I just explained how it was. So now they look more similar. There is a jury, there is oral trials, there is a defense attorney, so now it looks, it's, it looks more like a, you know, a regular trial. Uh, but these are, you know, pos uh, these are some positive results. But I, I, I think there is also some worrisome, um, um, worrisome aspects continuing in Mexico. One is that the reform has very low acceptability among police officers. We collected this survey in, among police officers in Nuevo León, in the city of Monterrey. In, different, in eight different municipalities, asking them about the reform. Um, so it's, it's around 3,000 police officers. And 80% believe that the system lets criminals go free. Uh, so they don't really feel that the system allows them to do their job. Um, and 17 now believe that the system protects criminals too much. So this, this can become problematic because police can really start, start, you know, try to go around the system. And I, and I will show you one way in which they are doing this. Uh, then the other, the other problem, and I will elaborate on this more, is the police used to investigate by torturing. Now what they, they need to develop actual investigative capacity and they don't have that. They don't know how to investigate crimes. There is no capacity. There has not, never been investment in this because it was very easy to convict everyone <laughs> based on torture. And this is a really huge problem in Mexico because we also have a very large problem of impunity. Over 90% of, of crimes go without being resolved. There is a huge problem with disappearances, for example, and homicides never resolved. And so the fact that Police cannot investigate this is really problematic because criminals obviously know that they can go free, right? So this is, and then there is, in addition, very strong popular demand for police to torture, and I will show that. Um, so if police do not torture an, anymore so much because they still do it, but not as much as before, what else they can use to, you know, to convict someone? if they don't know how to investigate, what is starting to happen, and we observe this, is that they start to plant evidence. So guns, drugs, and clothes, 
are now, before the reform, we barely saw those as being decisive evidence in, in, in trials, and now with the reform, we see a very large increase. And forensic evidence, which is what they should be doing, DNA, blood tests, for, you know, whatever, it's really more scientific investigation, they don't seem to be using that at all. Uh, so that is concerning, uh, because police can still commit atrocities, but in an, a different way, you know, convicting persons who are innocent in this, in this way. Um, and then I told you another big problem is that uh, the mass public endorses uh, police brutality. And this is, this is a huge problem. So to understand that, we collected this um, survey experiment in a large representative sample of 1,200 um, uh, people in Mexico. And we began by telling them, imagine a scenario in which a group of criminals has been operating for several months in this municipality. The criminals can frighten the population because they have been, and then we, to some of them, we tell them stealing cars, to other we, tell them extorting and killing. And in the other case, we don't mention a crime. And then we, we tell them following that, now imagine that the police detain two suspects, but they still have no evidence against men. The police torture them until they confess to committing the crimes. And then they are taken before a judge and the judge, and then we tell, uh, we, we tell them, uh, the, the respondents, the judge, in one case, we assign sentences them to several years in prison based on the confession that the police obtained uh, through torture. And then in the other, we tell them, the police, uh, the judge let the, the, the suspects go free because they violated their rights uh, when the police tortured them. And so we ask whether you ag agree with, with this decision. And what is really striking is that Regardless of what they hear, they want the judge to convict, uh, regardless of what they hear. So there is a really very strong punitive um, demand, and they don't care that this violates human rights, that torture violates human rights, or that the judge says this is wrong. They, they want the judge to convict, right? So there is a, there is a very strong support for this uh, type of abuse in Mexico. Um, so the, the, the good news is that when we study police abuse, we can think of acts of brutality as being inherent in some defective part of the personality of police officers. And that would be really hard to fix. Uh, or that they also respond to institutional incentives. And if that is the case, it's easier to fix that. It's, more, it's possible. So the work shows there might be really inherent deficient traits of many police officers who are used to working under this system, but that if you change the incentives, there is going to be a change in behavior. And I think this is a very important result of, of the work. Um, another very important result of the work is that a democracy without, um, without um, guardrails risks resorting to autocratic style police abuses when faced with violent threats, which is what I, I have shown. Uh, militarized security interventions sharply increase human rights abuses and torture. We have another paper showing that those militarized interventions that um, the Calderon government um, enacted in Mexico were associated with sharp increases in violence, not reductions. So what we demonstrate with both types of work is that these militarized interventions increase violence and increase human rights abuses. So, so there is no trade-off. It's not like we're reducing violence through doing these interventions, uh, but violent human rights. In the case of Mexico, both things increase. And then, again, these autocratic judiciaries are very important uh, in creating and legitimizing abuses. And unfortunately, they can survive democratization, as the case of Mexico demonstrates. So I'm going to... to, to to, to, I, I was going to talk about Brazil, but I think it's maybe too long. Or should I go? Okay. Okay, so this is the work on Mexico. And the work on Brazil is, is on lethal force uh, and specific, specifically focused on Rio de Janeiro's favelas. Uh, and this is a picture of um, a po police officer getting ready to occupy, and that's the way they 
call it. It's like a military invasion, Rosinia. <coughs> and we were actually there uh, when that happened, um, in Rosinia collecting interviews and doing work. Um, this is the type of policing that Rio's favelas were and have been accustomed to. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about attempts to reform this, this form of very violent police forces there, some of the lessons learned and some of the challenges that remain. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of background, in Brazil, one person is killed by the police every nine minutes. Uh, Rio de Janeiro cops are the most violent in the world. They have killed close to 20,000 people from 2003 to 2019. Uh, just in 2019, uh, they killed 1,814 people. Uh, so this is really a massive problem. It's a very brutal system and it's very violent. So how can you affect this reality? And unfortunately, it's not very easy. It has not been very, um, what has happened has not been very um, optimistic. Uh, there was some, some optimism. I'll show you when and then how it unraveled. Uh, so the military police, this is the, the military police of Rio de Janeiro. So this is the, sorry, the way to reduce the, um, has employed unprecedented lethal force against, against criminal actors, but obviously this lethal force also affects residents in the favelas. Uh, literally, what happens is that there are armed confrontations happening all the time in the favelas and a lot of residents die in the crossfire, but also when police invade favelas, they, they target residents. So they target residents, for example, when police officers are killed, Often it has happened that they go back and kill uh, in revenge, and that affects uh, also women and children, not only criminals. So the problem is it's affecting innocent and not innocent people, but obviously police should never treat innocent people that way either, right? Um, and the way police killings are... are register are, are, are as autos de resistencia, which means that they are presumed to happen in resistance to police action. So they are presumed to be legitimate and nobody investigates them. The, the civil police, which is the equivalent to this, the, the investigative police in Brazil, in Mexico here is called the civil police, is in charge of investigation. They never investigate that. Superiors in the military, uh, in the military police itself never investigate the, the, the killings, and courts never sanction them. Um, I, I was working, during, when I was in, in, in Rio, working during all these years, I went to Stockholm, um, Stockholm in, in California because the, I was um, trying to observe a ceasefire operation that they were using there. Uh, and I was in close contact with the police officers that were, um, performing this operation. Uh, the ceasefire means it's a way of pacifying, I, I don't want to go in detail, but it's a strategy to pacify uh, 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 fights between rival gangs uh, in which the police try to use non-coercive um, measures. Um, and what I described to uh, Chief Jones is the name of the police, I described what we were observing and, and, she, and he told us seriously, they never investigate, at least there, he said, when a police killing happens, there is an investigation outside of the police, right? So he was surprised that, you know, th there can be 20,000 people killed and there is no investigation. I mean, maybe there has been two or three cases, but there is no investigation. So this is very serious. Um, and so what this means is that police in Rio have traditionally have had a license to kill. Nobody punished them for doing that. Uh, and then we also observe, as we observed in Mexico, that there is very strong mass support for this. So there is this common phrase in Brazil that it says a good criminal is a dead criminal. And this is a survey that was collected among um, um, all cities in Brazil, a representative sample of cities in Brazil. So this is more like middle class Brazilians. And you observe that 50 4% of white people support this phrase, which is another way of saying, yes, police can kill. There is another phrase that also is commonly used, which is um, human rights are for humans. 
So it's, a, it's a very dehumanizing as well. And there is also ample support for that. Um, and here you, you see that among black Brazilians, there is less support, but still quite, quite a bit of it. And then uh, these are people of mixed race. So we observe a little bit of difference in terms of skin, uh, skin color uh, and race. Um, that's the way the census classifies uh, 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 people in Brazil. So it's by skin color. Um, very, it's different from here. And then what we observe is in the same survey, here I construct an index. So how much you fear crime? The more people fear crime, so you are asked about how much you fear walking in the streets, how much you fear being killed, how much. The more, more people fear crime, the more they support this a good criminal is a dead criminal. When you fear crime, it doesn't mean that necessarily you are the victim of crime because we observe that fear of crime can come really because of the uh, you know, um, uh, information you observe in TV, in, mass, uh, in social media, and the like, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean more victimization. So the, one of the papers I wrote attempt, uh, studied in detail this attempt to demilitarize the police and change, change the policing approach in Rio. So Rio went from having a heavy, very heavily militarized policing approach they would use this special operation unit called BOPE, uh, who was Zionist, literally the Zionist uh, skull with two uh, uh, re revolvers and, and a knife. Uh, and they enter the favelas with a tank and have really militaristic strategies. They are training counterinsurgency. And that's the way the military police in Rio has dealt with the favelas for many, many years. So when the Olympic Games were going to come and the, and the World Cup, Rio's government um, decided to make a reform and change the strategy. And they introduced the, what they were called the pacifying police units. And the attempt was to demilitarize the police and bring police officers uh, that were trained in human rights and a very different mentality to the, to the favelas with permanent presence in these, in these territories. And, and that's what we studied. When I uh, went to Rio, I, I thought, well, is this really attempt to humanize police going to work? And is this is really going to be an alternative to have a better police for these populations that have been traditionally um, uh, repressed? And so I, I devoted really a long time doing a lot of uh, field work, uh, anthropological work, but also a lot of data analysis as well. And in similar way as I have described what we did in Mexico, we, can, we gather all information of how many people were killed by police in, in, in every uh, census unit in, in, in the city of Rio. And we could see where this reform had been introduced, when and how that changed. So whether the reform could be causally associated with increases or decreases of police violence. So the data that we collected looks at uh, killings by the police, and it also looks at as homicides. So we can see whether the reform changed those two. But we also see, we, we have a really interesting data set that looks at crime reports coming from the favelas uh, that describe um, with a lot of detail what happened in, 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 a, in, a, in a given situation. So we can also describe those. And basically the results is it are positive. The UPPs are associated with a 45% decrease in police killings, which is a very important effect. Um, we also are able to show that in over 60% of the the favelas that receive these uh, UPPs, there is a reduction of 60% in homicides. And in those areas where homicides reduced and where police stop killing so much, police legitimacy also increases. But there is a set of favelas, and I, I, I don't want to go in detail of you know, what accounts for that, where the opposite occurred, where crime increased when the, when the police uh, arrived. And so in 40% of the cases, we observe negative results. And in some very visible favelas, such as Complexo do Aleman, we observe police killings increasing. Because in these territories, 
um, this faction that controls that uh, territory is the headquarter of one of the most powerful drug factions in Rio. And they have um, this ideology very different to another faction of, of fighting and killing police officers. So they give money to residents to, to, and, and to um, cartel leader, uh, members to kill officers. So if you send pacifying units to these territories, they become very vulnerable. So what happened is that immediately when police started to get killed, the military police reaction with, reacted with more force, and that escalated into a war. So not every situation was positive, but I think despite the fact that the reform was delegitimized, um, because there was a lot of abusive behavior by police officers on the ground, and then also the state of Rio lost credibility, uh, um, commitment to the reform because as they intervened in the favelas, the drug factions shifted operations to other areas of the city that started to affect the middle class and made more visible the problem of, of um, drug trafficking uh, violence. And so the state lost commitment to this reform and now they have reverted to the old ways of you know, doing business. So bad, it, it became that when the governor, um, uh, right-wing governor, um, Wilson was elected in 2018, he told, the, you know, the, literally said, police have you know, to shoot to the head to kill. He got himself in an helicopter with a machine gun and flew over a favela, and then they started shooting over a favela from that helicopter. That was the governor of the, of the, of the state of Rio. Um, so the problem became so severe that the Supreme Court intervened and said they, Rio has to come with a plan, a strategy, and a budget to reduce police violence. This was in 2019. And so the situation, as I mentioned, if you see the, the tendency of police violence, I think I have it here. Um, yes, I, I, I think I have it here. Wait. Well, I don't have it here. Um, I have it at the end. Uh, I'm sorry about this. I just went over the second part of the presentation. Um, so if you see the tendency of police violence, it, it dramatically increases. So one of the big problems that we observe with this intervention is that as police officers are sent to the favelas, they are starting to commit a lot of abuses, not only in terms of violence, but also hitting people, uh, you know, stop and frisking people, doing a lot of street abuse. And that reduced the legitimacy of the, of the reform. So one of the things we wanted to understand is whether introducing cameras in these settings would change police behavior at that level. So we, we were able to do a randomized evaluation of cameras in Rosinha, which is the favela I just at the beginning showed you that we were there the day um, they were intervened. Uh, so there were a lot of scandals um, of torturing, police torturing uh, residents, killing innocent children and women, planting weapons after, after killing innocent people, and so on. So these were the types of behaviors that we wanted to see whether we could change. And this is, the, the, literally, this is the police unit, and it's full of holes. Like it's a, a, you know, metal <laughs> full of holes. They are put in very sort of vulnerable, um, with very little support uh, from the state. And so the, we spent there a year putting cameras and, and studying how police behave differently or not with the cameras. And I can show you that, yeah, we were, we assigned cameras to more than 8,500 8, shifts and 470 police officers there from 2015, December to November 2016. And I'm going to go quickly here. I mean, these are the type of abuses we hear. So we gave uh, respondents a list of words, you know, do you, uh, distrust, fear, disrespect, how do you feel about the police? And they all gave us negative answers. Only 3% reported respect or admiration. Um, 61 reported being feared, uh, having fear of being killed by the police. Um, and in, in only 10% would resort to the police if they had a conflict. So there is very little uh, legitimacy of the police in, this, in these favelas. When we introduced the cameras, what happened? So we find uh, in this experiment a very sharp reduction of stop and searches and other encounters. So this amounts to 39% reduction. So police are not 
frisking, slapping faces, hitting residents so much when they have the cameras. But a very unexpected result also came from this experiment is that they stopped doing necessary functions. Like for example, when they call them for help, if they have a camera, they don't, they don't go. Uh, or in the street, if they, you know, there is a resident running asking for help, they just don't do it because they have a camera. So police stop doing abusive uh, behavior, but also necessary behavior, right? Because they have the camera. So that is a really interesting, unexpected finding. Um, and then we had access to gunshots. So how many gunshots they sh shot during the experiment, and I just want to point that, I mean, this is a lot of detail, but these are the proximity policing units. So when they, sorry, this, when they have a, uh, when they don't have a camera, they shot uh, 113 bullets, and when they have a camera, zero. Um, the same with the radio patrullas. So these are the, the units that are similar to the BOPES within the, 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 the Rosinha. Uh, so they still confront criminals, but they use also less bullets. But we cannot do statistical analysis here because there are only 27 events uh, that use force, despite the fact that they were shooting so many bullets. You know? um, uh, okay, so we also observe very interesting results. Not only violence against uh, residents decrease, but also violence against police officers. We ask police officers if residents curse them, throw water, throw urine, throw stones, uh, verbal threats or physical attack them. And this is, the blue one is the baseline, so when the experiment started. And then um, the, this one that you barely can see is in the middle, and, and this is at the end of the study. So you can see that in all cases there is a very sharp reduction in violence against police. So, so police are less, uh, less violent, but also residents are less violent, uh, less violent against the police when they were in cameras. But here is another counterintuitive result. Um, so they, one of them is that they stop doing necessary functions. The other is that they disobey the protocol. And we very well knew that this was going to happen. Um, so we knew that if you ask police officers to turn the camera on when they, uh, you know, uh, uh, they um, uh, abordar, how do you say this? They stop someone or they encounter someone. They, that's the, the, they have to record, but we knew they were not going to do that. So we assigned two different protocols, one in which the cameras had to be on all the time, and one in which they turned them on when they encountered someone, right? Uh, at the middle of the study, they abandoned the always on. It was impossible to, you know, to uh, implement, so we left the same protocol as it's used here. So it's voluntary on the police to, to turn on the camera. And so we observe really like a lot of disobedience to the protocol. Uh, so they stop doing the functions that they have and they disobey put, you know, turning on the camera. So then at the middle of the study, we say, what do we do? We want them to obey. So we assign cameras to supervisors also randomly. And we observe that when cameras to, uh, are assigned to supervisors, police officers turn their cameras on more often and do the necessary functions more. So the study in a way points to two interesting interventions. One is assign cameras to supervisors, not only to the frontline officers. And the other is like potentially there is already this technology. There, are, there is a way to turn the cameras from the central station, not giving the freedom to police to turn them on or not. And I think that would be a really important um, intervention. But the, the results are very suggestive that cameras can have a strong impact if you resolve these, these uh, problems. Uh, obviously, they are not perfect because, as we say, police disobeyed the protocol, and then we do a, an analysis of who disobeys the protocol the most. And what is really disturbing is the ones who obey the protocol the most are the ones who are afraid of residents, and the ones who disobey the protocol the most are the ones who have killed someone in the past. So officers who are disobeying are precisely the ones who might be the most problematic. Uh, so that's the... the, the end of the, the story <laughs> about the cameras. And um, I, I mean, this is a third study that I don't want to go in, in, into it. It's about, but I just want to show you the data that I promised. So this is, this is police killings in Rio. This is when the UPPs began. This is the 
pacifying police units, you can see this sharp decrease in police killings. And then um, here we start to observe this increase in police killings. And it's when Complexo uh, Alemán was intervened, the headquarters of this very large, uh, powerful uh, drug uh, faction. And that's when the, the, the criminal group started to be displaced to other areas. So we observe a really dramatic increase in, in, in police killings. 2015 is the economic crisis. And then there ha they had introduced a really interesting system that I was going to show you that started to pay police officers to kill less. It's called the Sistema di Meta. So literally, in, the, in 1995, they had introduced a policy that would pay police officers to kill. It was called bono di bravura. And so it's like bravery bonus. It only lasted a couple of years, but obviously, you know, the, the culture of police violence is there. So in 2011, they introduced this called Sistema de Metas, which now rewards the opposite, right? And in the 2015 economic crisis, the, the government didn't pay the bonuses to the police. So this system started to unravel as well, the economic crisis, and then came Wilson in 2018. So you see this very sharp increase in police killings in Rio, such that today the Supreme Court you know, ruled in that way. So that's what I'm saying, the conclusions for the Rio de Janeiro case are problematic and, and not so optimistic. But we observe one important finding is that militarized policing is heavily associated with very high levels of police violence. So the, the philosophy behind the pacifying police units was correct and had a 45% decrease in police violence. But then obviously these are communities that are segregated and marginalized and security policies are not made um, to serve those communities. It's really <laughs> to serve the middle class and those who are outside of the favela. So the, the policies were reversed and the, the conclusion there is not so optimistic. So I, I, I think I will leave you there with a lot of food for thought and how difficult this problem is in, in the areas of the world I study. So typically, you know, if we, we think about um, political economy, the individual says, what I'm willing to do is give up some of my rights in turn for some type of economic or personal security. So I will cede those rights over to the state. And now the state has probably more control over my individual liberties otherwise. But as a, uh, in return for that, I'm going to get some type of security, whether it be economic security or physical security. It seems in both of these cases that they didn't get either, right? So they ceded over their, their rights, their individual human rights, to the state without getting any benefit. Um, what happened here? Is, this, this seems to go against what we, we would think about in terms of general you know, political economy. Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. And the, so the problem is general in, in Latin America, not only Mexico and Brazil. I think this is, you know, we are the most violent region of the world outside of war zones. Uh, and this is not common knowledge. In reality, m more people die as a result of this type of wars than in civil wars. And so what you are saying is, is completely precise. Uh, we observe that citizens are threatened by criminal groups, so the state is not able to control those. And then the state itself becomes a source of violence against its citizens. No? So I, I began the talk talking about exactly that dilemma, right? Because it's supposed to be the monopoly of violence that should resolve violence. But here, 
the, there is no monopoly, but also the, the state that has violence is, is using it improperly. Uh, so it's very interesting, the question, because you would imagine that citizens, these are democracies, would vote against these no, policies. And this is, I think, something that we need to research more in political science. So why is there so little accountability uh, in, in security policies? You would imagine that governments would eventually, you know, with the electoral mechanism, we would eventually select governments that are able to solve this dilemma, but that doesn't happen. We select governments that promise more violence and that bring, in the end, more violence. And I think the, the precise mechanisms are not well understood. So now I want to explore more these links between public preferences over security policies and, and actions of government, because I think there is something very uh, missing in our democracies that does not correct these problems. Martin. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to tie together two things you said. So one was a kind of need to develop a forensic science in yes. the region and norms of using forensic science. Mm -hmm. And then the other is the kind of social statistics like that 54% of white people would endorse the idea that a good criminal is a dead criminal and these kind of ideas of human rights of humans. So I'm thinking about white collar crime because if we take like a good criminal is a dead criminal, then we have a what about white collar crime because like, they're criminals. And so in particular ideas like con men who are illegally taking the savings from people who have savings and then ki certain kinds of corruption that affect citizens and sort of tax theft yeah. in certain ways. And then there are forensic science approaches that can target that kind of crime that would also help to target the kind of gang related crime that's drug based. And so two examples. So one is, you may know, I'm afraid I wasn't able to, I can't get on the internet, so I can't find it, the name of it, but there's a, um, in forensic science of accounting, there's the natural ratios that appear for any kind of number. A large proportion yes. of them end up starting a one, as you, okay, you know the you know the thing. So, um, so for those of you who don't, it's you don't get like in the natural world for any kind of number, like finance, how much money do you have in your bank account? It's not the case that like one out of ten of those numbers start with a nine, one out of ten start with an eight. It's not like that. It starts with one and then it gets gradually less likely. So for that reason, so then you can find uh, accounting fraud using that ratio, for example. Um, so that's one example where you could use that against white collar crime, but also you can chase the, the gang money Absolutely. that way. And then the other example is the computing, forensic science of computing. And so what I'm wondering is if you could take like public um, attitudes towards white collar crime that affects the public, and then use that to create more norms of using forensic science to catch the kinds of crimes that are then causing a lot of street violence. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a very interesting suggestion. Yes, I, I, you know, I haven't really thought about <laughs> white collar crime much. Uh, so the suggestion is really very interesting. And uh, the, the, what you suggest is really chasing after the money, no? And that's something that it's it's not done. It's not been done. I mean, so we, we are all fighting wars against drugs, and that part is not being uh, chased. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is another issue that I was going to mention. So I, I said that, so the state can turn violence against its citizens, but also can become part of the criminal network. And what we do observe both in Brazil and in Mexico, is that the criminals are able to buy themselves through politicians uh, all the way up uh, into integrating into the state. So the militias in Rio, which are, they are like vigilante groups that emerged in, in these communities, originally promising to fight drug traffickers, but then they evolve into super lucrative businesses. They control real estate. They even now control weapons, uh, drugs. So they, they are former police officers, fire, um, firefighters, and custodians in, in the prisons. Uh, these are the vigilantes. And what happens is that 
politicians need access to the territories to get elected. They know very well who is in which territory, so politicians make deals with them. Uh, and in that way, they buy themselves into the government. Uh, in Mexico, the same thing happens. There is so many, I don't know if you heard, so many majors now being killed. Uh, every time there is election cycles, because that's the way the cartels penetrate the state. Um, so, so that's the other way in which, you know, going to your question about the monopoly of violence, I mean, it's really associated with the criminal, so it's not legitimate at all in that way. And so, obviously, it, it would point to the police <laughs> and the politicians or some. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, more questions than answers, I guess. Um, so I wonder if there is a, what do you think about, about this? It seems that something that is going on, at least in the, the Mexican case with the, with the reform, is something like uh, reforming the formal institutions, w but not the informal institutions, and then you know changing the, yes. the trial system, but but you know not developing the skills required for investigation, and and you know even deeper in some sense like not explaining the legislative process or sorry the you know the criminal justice system to the people, and then so they can understand that it's not about you know killing the criminal, but about the due process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this like leads to, I guess, or I think, very bad outcomes in the sense like now um, people on the, you know, people talk to the gangs and tell them like, please do justice because the government Absolutely. is not doing anything, right? So, so in some sense, even if the violence re is reduced at the state level, it seems that it's increased generally, right? And now, yeah, and, and actually the legitimacy of the paras, the, you, the gang members, uh, that that increases, right? So, so yeah. So I wonder what you think. Like, do you think this the there is a mismatch between formal and yes. informal reform that we should like really care about or something like that? But thank you. Yes, I now I'm really intrigued by this. I mean, I I, I studied the torture behavior, no, but then as I showed in the slides, then this problematic behavior starts to now pop up. It's like they are planting evidence, right? So they, of course, they are getting away with this. That's the way they are sending a lot of people to prison. Uh, so why there is no real reform of the system? And this is your question. And, and I'm now co-authoring a, a paper with with an anthropologist who has been working in very close contact with the investigative uh, police and the prosecutors in Mexico City, trying to provide answers to this question because it's really something that, that I mean, that's, that's where you need to, that's what you need to change, right? And it's not, I mean, obviously there is a big change in reductions of torture and we, we have to acknowledge the importance of the reform. But in general, the criminal justice system doesn't work because it's not doing its job of really sanctioning crime. Uh, crime is com it's complete impunity. No? So what are the options that people have in Mexico? I don't know if you heard of the... So in some places, it becomes so bad that autodefensas auto or vigilantes have emerged in Michoacán and other states in Mexico. And then they actually, you know, worked for a little while, and many of them were recaptured by cartels. Uh, then the state tried to co-op them. And so it was really, the, I worked there uh, for a different project in Michoacán quite a bit. And uh, it, it's, it's just many parts of the state have been war zones for, for years, right? Um, so, and, and the current gover government, uh, which is very popular, uh, I mean, has done nothing on security. There is this, the levels of homicides this year are the highest, um, and there is, again, no clue, really, of how to reform the system, which is... Uh, so I, I struggle a lot because they, for example, in, in, in Brazil, the police really volunteer a lot of data that was very sensitive 
to, to, to us, you know, my team, and while we were doing this work, even, you know, we did this randomized evaluation, and there were many people within the police interested in understanding what would work. And so we work with those officers uh, in close contact, as well with, with residents of favelas and NGOs. And in Mexico, I never found any, that openness. They hide all the information, everything is, it's hidden. And, and, and really the only way to, is I'm not saying like academics, we can provide some answers, right? Because we can provide measures and, but there is no attempt at, at, at making these policies right, you know, evidence-based. So it's very difficult then to provide answers, no? <laughs> Uh, there was a hacker, actually, now we have this data, which is, I, I, for years, wanted to know where the armed forces were deployed in Mexico, uh, precisely, right? And this impossible information to get, because with that we can really measure more precisely, you know, what I, you know, what I have tr tried to do. And a hacker now has the data, uh, so researchers are going to use it, because that's the information that they should release to be able to understand how to fix the problem, right? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is uh, fascinating, and I have many questions, but I'll limit myself to two. The first one is about the uh, involvement of the military in policing, mm -hmm. and a large part of your story is how things get even worse when the military arrive. And I'm wondering, yes. looking at this comparatively throughout the Latin American context, what do we know about how this impulse to draw in the military can be resisted? Mm. What, what are the, the institutional or other types of barriers that, that exist that might prevent that, since obviously this is something undesirable? So that's the first question. Yes. The second one is about learning from China. Mm -hmm. And what, what I have in mind is, so in the Chinese context, because there is a very high density of cameras in urban neighborhoods, mm. urban neighborhoods organized in grids, everything is supervised all the time, and then the camera feed goes to a police unit, which can then dispatch officers to deal with the problems. And obviously, the settings are extraordinarily different, but I mean, there is no killing in, in China, right? Yes. So that's a different model of of extraordinary level of surveillance of communities through cameras. Is that coming anywhere in Latin America? I mean, there's some research on like Ecuador, maybe, I don't know, but in, like in, yes. in Brazil, Mexico, is this something that is being considered by the Ministry of the yes. Interior as it's thinking about it, the future of policing? Yes, very good question. Uh, I, I will begin by the second one. Um, so Mexico City has cameras all over. And um, what my anthropologist co-author tells me is now they use those cameras. So let's say there is this um, uh, you know, robbery happening here. And so they, they, they use these cameras to say, OK, that person is, is <laughs> walking in there, apprehending. But maybe that person is completely unrelated to the crime. Um, so. so they are not using it to, in the way that China is using them, right? Uh, I don't know why they, they are using it for. What is the intention in, in China? Um, so the idea is that you will be able to dispatch a police unit to the source of a crime okay. within two to three minutes. Mm. Um, so it's rapid police response. So that the police don't have to yes. control all the time. I mean, you have cameras everywhere. Yes, and I think Mexico City does have that. And what I hear from my friend, um, his name is Esteban, who is writing this with me, is that in the prosecutor's office, he has seen that, that that's how they use them. Oh, you know, this person, this is where the robbery happened, this person happens. So it's not, not necessarily helping to solve the crimes, but I frankly don't know. So I, I've been, as I asked them, you know, to release the data, and then, yes. of course, the other function of cameras is that mm -hmm. when you know that you're being surveilled, you're perhaps yes, less likely absolutely. to engage in certain types of behavior. Yes, that, right. that's a super good question. Yes, I, I will find out more about how they are being used. In Mexico City is highly surveilled with cameras. And because yes. cameras are becoming cheaper and cheaper yes, every day, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a relatively cheap intervention for the police to install them if they work. 
Absolutely. That's the other thing. And then you need humans to deal with the feed of the camera. So it's yeah. not, I mean, you still have to invest in those resources. Absolutely. But, you know, it's a different approach towards police. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have people with machine guns. You can have cameras. And the military yes. resisting the impulse. So let me think. Um, so interestingly, the, so I think the impulse is towards militarizing. That's the general impulse that we observe. Uh, I mean, in Brazil, the military, so it's the military police, right? But it's, n it's not part of the military, but the strategies. So there are two things. It's deploying the armed forces or militarizing police. And they are, I mean, they, they go in parallel, right? So, in, uh -huh. so in, in Brazil, we observe a highly militarized police with very little intervention by the military. Uh -huh. But in Mexico, we observe the opposite. Now, the, the military, uh, Calderon deployed the military widely. And, and then um, the current government uh, actually completely militarized security. So it's called now La Guardia Nacional. And it depends fully on the military. Um, so it's not only security, but they are now in control of building airports, building trains. They are really in control of everything now in, in, in Mexico, heavily militarized. Although the, the military Guardia Nacional has been little studied, and um, I would love to understand, they behave very differently to the, the former military, so the one that Calderon deployed. Uh, and I really fully don't understand why. And, and they have, interestingly, legitimacy. Uh, and another question that you raised is restraining the impulse. Paradoxically, when you ask in public opinion surveys, it's the, the, the institution with the most credibility among all the coercive. So that's very interesting. People perceive that the military is going to you know, solve their problems because they are so afraid. Um, and so my impression is that, okay, you deploy the military, what happened, let's say, in Ciudad Juarez when there was the war, the military were deployed, or in Veracruz they are deployed. And if they remain there for a long time, I think they would start committing abuses the same as police, right? But again, we have no way of knowing because we don't have the information. Um, but this is a, a good question. I think that the, the, who resists militarizing, whenever there is fear and this fear is fed you know, into the mass public, I think that's the instinct, no? to, to resort to harsh measures. Um, so, yeah, I mean, for example, Argentina would be a place where the military is, very, is not legitimate. So I, I wonder if how they would respond if they were having the same problems as Mexico or... I have no answer for this, sorry. <laughs> All right, and I, uh, thank you for this. I also have a question on the on militarized policing. So you mentioned it several times, you know, that militarized policing tends to lead to more violence. I think that is kind of the overall story. Um, but, you know, to what degree is that dependent on context? Because there are certain paradoxical situations, for example, in Venezuela, yes. what we're seeing is that militarized policing hugely killed a lot of people, violated, violated a lot of human rights, but it also led to greater organization of violence, no? And so you had, instead of disorganized violence and lots of competition and conflict between small groups and, and bandas, you, you have these big megabandas now that, that control illicit markets, and violence is actually dro dropped through a very sort of paradoxical, not through the mechanism that the, you know, the military thought would mm. happen, that, that criminals are now scared, but because they're now sort of more organized. Um, so, you know, mm. to, and, I, and I think Ben Lessing has found something similar in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. you know, and so to what degree, so how does that, uh, what do you think about that, or how does that affect the story, you know, with militarized policing? So, yeah, what, it's very interesting what you referred to, because I, I did a study precisely on criminal organization and how that was affected by the strategy. It's the opposite of what you are describing. In Mexico, the, 
Felipe Calderón government follow what he, you know, we call a beheading strategy. So he was really targeting the leaders of cartels. When he got elected, they publicized the list. These are the, the leaders that we are going to target. And at the end of his administration, they had basically, you know, either killed or arrested a lot, you know, most of the members of the list. And the paper that we wrote demonstrates that in doing that, I mean, in, in, in sort of beheading the organization, what they did is they fracture the, the criminal underworld. And so we observe the opposite of what you are describing in Venezuela, which was now we have so many more cartels. We have fragmentation, cartels fighting within each other to, for the leadership position. And that's really where the situation became very messy in Mexico because crime used to be organized and now it's disorganized, no? Um, so it's the opposite of what you are describing yeah, it's, it's through the... Yes. Yes. It, exactly. So in Mexico it broke it up and now which, which is really worrisome the, I don't know, I mean, for sure you've heard of Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, which is the most recent cartel. Now it's in control of almost all the territory. Uh, so you see reorganization, right, of the cartels, but it's really through violence. It's really through, through fight, through, through wars. So it's not the process that you describe for Venezuela. Um, and then in, in the case of Brazil, it's very interesting what demilitarized, and I, this is Ben Lessing's argument, pushed... Um, pushed criminal organizations into prisons because they came also with mass incarceration. And what he and others have shown is that it has created very, very powerful criminal structures from prison that have really ample reach across the entire territory of Brazil. So his argument there is like mass incarceration has this unintended consequence of strengthening the criminal groups from prison, no? Because when you get to prison, you have to, you know, make a lie with one or the other, right? So they become really huge organizations. And he says this is really, I mean, they, they parallel the power of the state, which is really problematic. Yeah. So we have time for one more question. Um, but just so everyone knows, Professor Magaloni is going to be around for a little bit afterwards mm. um, for about a half an hour. So it's our last question. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I had two questions, but I have to pick one, right? All right, um, I think early on you mentioned something about um, economic inequality as being a, a yes. factor for why uh, homicide rates by police are so high and maybe generally they're so high. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking at sort of like the tail end of that chart that's up on the screen where like the economic crisis in 2015 yeah. and then you know killings by police go way up. And now I'm thinking like, did like overall homicides go way up? Uh, that, so that's like the, the narrow question. And then this part of the same question is like, um, how does economic inequality in general, like across Latin America yeah. or over time, affect both killings by police and killings overall? That's a big question. But if you could say something to that, oh, I'd absolutely. appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. This is a, a very important question. So in cross-sectional statistical analysis, so not necessarily, you know, finding causation, which is really a lot of what we now do with, you know, you know statistics. The most important correlate of high levels of violence is inequality. Um, so that, that also might explain why Latin America is so violent. I mean, not, not the only reason, but one of the big reasons, because we are, the most unequal region as well. So you observe, for example, South Africa also has very high levels of violence, very unequal. Uh, the US relative to Europe is very unequal. No? So I think inequality at a cross-sectional level has very you know, strong correlation. The problem is like we don't have enough data uh, because it, across countries we have the Gini coefficient and we don't have enough time variability with this data set to be able to do the analysis that you, that you, you know, are proposing. The data is not good enough to do that. Um, but what I understand economists have shown is that at the at, you know, cross-sectional level, it does seem to matter, but movements across 
time like that don't seem to be explained by, uh, because inequality, uh, here is what changes the economic crisis, but uh, we don't know about the inequality itself, right? I mean, so, so it's a very important question. We, we know it affects it because we've seen it in the correlations, but we lack sufficiently good data. And I think like there is another way through inequality, in which inequality affects this phenomenon, and it's by the way in which the state decides to invest its you know, public goods. So when you have very unequal societies, the state responds to one group and abandons no, the poor, right? So it, it really responds to, so, so that's what, what I observed in Rio. You send police forces um, that are better trained to the wealthier neighborhoods. That's where, you know, you want the visibility. And I remember when, when I was very frustrated by this, you know, the escalation of, of this. I mean, it, it almost was like a personal failure because I was so embedded in the whole. And I asked, um, I, I also had these findings that if you targeted the interventions where gangs were fighting each other and causing more killings, that it was going to be more successful. Uh, so the UPP intervention, that's one of the big findings of that paper. And I was sharing this with one police officer whom we had a lot of trust. And, and he said, why didn't they, they target the intervention there, right, in the most violent areas? And he said um, something to me which really, you know, very, in a very sincere way, and I want to repeat what he said, Beatriz, the, gov the policy was not designed, and he didn't agree with that, with what he said. The, the policy was not designed, and this was the phrase, for, for, to prevent black people from killing each other. Uh, so what he meant is the policy was designed uh, because the government wanted to deter the, the faction that was causing most pro more problems uh, to the government and to, this, to, to the wider um, Brazilian society, right? So when I talk about inequalities, the state does not, so there are two types of citizenships, you know, in these in this, uh, societies, or even three or four, right? And citizens who live in these areas don't have the same rights, they don't have the same services, they don't have the same um, presence of the state. And that's, I, I, to me, that's the result of inequality, is how the state uh, acts or enacts policies. Okay, well, on behalf of us at the Murphy Institute, I'd like to thank everyone for coming on a rainy Friday, and one more time, a round of applause for Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.